Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Oh, okay. thank you. Uh, we'll now start the post lunch session. Distinguished guests, legal luminaries, and esteemed participants. Ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now start the post lunch session. Distinguished guests, legal luminaries, and esteemed participants. Ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Thank you. We'll now start the post lunch session. Distinguished guests, legal luminaries, and esteemed participants. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all to the post-lunch session of the third HR Khanna Memorial National Symposium. My name is Rajat Mittal. I'm an advocate on record practicing in Supreme Court as a counsel specializing in taxation matters. In this session, we embark on a journey to explore the lives and legacies of the remarkable legal stalwarts who have left an indelible imprint on the modern Indian judicial system. In this session, we delve into the lives of extraordinary individuals who, through their unwavering commitment to justice, profound legal acumen, and relentless pursuit of truth have shaped the course of Indian jurisprudence. As we embark on this intellectual journey, let us open our minds and hearts to the wisdom and experience of these legal stalwarts. Let us pay homage to their tireless efforts in the upholding the rule of law, protecting individual liberties, and shaping a legal framework that fosters equality and justice for all. Once again, I extend my warmest welcome to each and every one of you. With these remarks, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Uday Shankar, Registrar, Hidayatullah National Law University, Raipur. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Uday Shankar. Dr. Uday Shankar is a legal scholar, academician, and an administrator whose expertise and dedication have played a vital role in shaping the educational landscape at HNLU Raipur and beyond. With a diverse range of accomplishment and wealth of experience, he has earned a reputation for his commitment to excellence and his passion for nurturing the next generation of legal professionals. As the registrar of HNLU Raipur, Dr. Udeshankar plays a crucial role in the institution's administration and development. He brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to his position, ensuring the smooth functioning of various academic and administrative processes within the university. His astute leadership and organizational skills have been instrumental in maintaining the high standards of academic excellence that HNLU Raipur is renowned for. Dr. Uday Shankar's commitment to legal ed education extends beyond the boundaries of the classroom. He actively engages in various academic activities, including conducting workshops, delivering lectures, and participating in conferences and seminars. As we have the privilege of Dr. Shankar's presence today, let us extend our warm appreciation for his significant contribution to the legal field and his unwavering commitment to shaping the minds of the future legal professionals. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Uday Shankar, a distinguished legal scholar, academician, and administrator. Uh, uh, Dr. Uday Shankar, I think your mic is muted. If, uh, yes. Am I audible now? Okay. 
good afternoon to all greetings from hidayatullah national law university it's a matter of a great privilege and honor for me to welcome esteemed panelist of uh, today's panel discussion i on behalf of hidayatullah national law university welcome honorable mr justice dimbagar datta judge supreme court of india honorable mrs justice geeta mittal former chief justice jammu and kashmir high court uh, senior advocate mr c s vaidyanathan supreme court of india the organizers of the program have identified a very relevant topic for today's panel discussion where they want the esteemed panelists to highlight the role of legal stalwarts in contributing the, the growth of uh, judicial system in the country as we know that judiciary as an important pillar of the state contributes to the growth of uh, the judicial uh, judicial system as well as it facilitates in establishing the rule of law and one for the indian judicial system we can say that it is uniquely designed having rid jurisdiction with the apex court original jurisdiction with the apex court appellate jurisdiction and then extraordinary jurisdiction with the apex court now with this range of jurisdictions available with the supreme court supreme court has been guiding and shaping the course of justice in this country as we know that the judicial system in this country is a three layered one supreme court at the apex high courts are at the mid level and we do have subordinate courts uh, at the bottom considering the adversarial system which prevails in this country lawyers play an instrumental role in designing and development of the course of justice yes and 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 particularly i would say in the matter of yeah. litigation and public interest litigation well, i'll turn it on there's a little problem i don't want to uh, you know so we have witnessed path breaking judgments through a public interest litigation where lawyers have played decisive role in extending helping hand to the court as a law student sudden judgments comes to our mind for example a series of judgments on environmental jurisprudence led by mr mc mehta so no denial that lawyers have been playing an important role in the governance of the country also through their inputs what they give while arguing in the court of law which becomes law of the land once the court pronounces the judgment and that many a times also create a sort of anchoring i would say in furthering the goal of justice and fulfilling the preambular promises given under the constitution that's the kind of prominent role which lawyers have been playing in this country uh, without getting into detail of the contribution of lawyers in our freedom movement post independence they have 
played a critical role in keeping the value of that independence alive and they have through their legal acumen have further strengthened those values which all of us cherish so in conclusion i would say that lawyers are not popular but they are indispensable that's what the saying says and no denial that some of them they mark they made an indelible mark in the profession and contributes to the phenomenal growth of profession and justice delivery system in the country thank you for giving this platform and providing me an opportunity to share my thoughts in brief on the topic identified for today's panel discussion thank you thank you dr uday shankar for those words now before we proceed with the discussions and deliberations of this symposium i kindly request your attention for a solemn moment of reflection and remembrance today we gather here not only to celebrate the remarkable contribution of justice acha khanna but also to honor his unwavering commitment to justice and indomitable spirit he embodied we shall now observe a minute of silence in remembrance of justice acha khanna request everyone to stand up for a moment for your respectful observance of the moment of silence thank you everyone i shall now request uh, mr siddharth gupta the ceo of can foundation to introduce the uh, uh, our guest for the second session just as dipankar dutta good evening uh, respected honorable mr justice mm sundresh judge supreme court of india and the chief guest who had presided over the previous session respected honorable mr justice deepankar datta judge supreme court of india and the presiding guest honorable mr justice geeta mittal respected mr c s vaidyanathan professor uday shekhar registrar hnlu raipur my colleagues in the can foundation all the student members and also the audience watching the third justice hr khanna memorial session a very good afternoon to all of you In the first session, there was an overwhelmingly enriching discussion on surveillance and privacy, which was like the opening overs of a cricket match. The second session is like the power play in cricket, the last ten overs in which either you win or lose. It being especially a post lunch session, people prefer not to sacrifice their afternoon nap at the cost of watching any academic session. To keep the tempo going, I'll also start with a real life story. The first wave of COVID pandemic. around april may 2020 was so horrific that not a single family was left in the country which had not lost their near and dear ones crematoriums and funeral pyres for the first time were having waiting queues of 10 to 12 hours people were extremely skeptical of even opening their doors to outsiders in these days of heightened aggravated fear a public servant in calcutta receives an order from the president's house delhi that he has to assume constitutional office at bombay around 2100 kilometers away from calcutta there were no airways no railways or any other public transport available the whole family of this gentleman was in deep stress and anxiety about what should be done unmindful of the risks involved responding to the clarion call of his duty he gets into his car with his son at the back seat 
drives himself 2100 kilometers from Calcutta to Bombay only to assume office on the date designated in the warrant. Yes, we are talking of none else but Justice Deepankar Datta only. This story was just a prelude to my introduction about him. It is said, if you intend to introduce a person from your heart, the introduction shouldn't be based on facts googled from Wikipedia, but woven from information called, culled out from people close to that person. I'll be sharing as part of my intro some lesser known facts not available in the public domain about his lordships. An introduction which I yearn to offer to a man who has always put his duties, his nation before himself. Justice Datta was born in 1965 because his father, late Sri Salil Kumar Datta, was a former judge of the Calcutta High Court. A presumption always arises that Justice Datta had an easy way to judgeship, but that's absolutely incorrect. Rather, Justice Datta lost his father when he was in the third year of his law school, when he had not even stepped in the Calcutta High Court. There was thus no question of him getting any extra discretion or leeway from the bench, his father not being there in the nearby courtroom. The towering presence of father in one's life as a banyan tree can be understood only by that person who loses that shadow at an early age of life and nobody else can explain what struggles one has to undergo or what challenges one has to face once that shadow disappears. Today, the strong, towering, erudite personality of Justice Datta is a clear testimonial to the challenges he faced and troubled times he went through at adolescence when you don't even understand how bad the world here is. A self-made man, a character cast in steel with an impeccable integrity, all attributable to the stupendous challenges that nature threw at him when he wasn't aware of the extent to which destiny can be severe to anybody. In fact, I would like to disclose a lesser known, lesser quoted fact about his lordships chronicled in the journals of Calcutta High Court. With a cost title, the Pankar Datta versus State of West Bengal, there are two reported landmark verdicts of the Calcutta High Court detailing the powers of traffic police of seizure of motor vehicle license of any own vehicle owner. In the one, Delivered in August 2004, it was laid down that a traffic personnel is not authorized to confiscate the license of any two-wheeler on the ground that he is not in possession of the registration card and the insurance certificate on any random spot checking. In the other one, delivered in 1996, it was held that when the motor vehicle license of any person is seized by the traffic personnel and he is ready to face the trial before the magistrate, then the vehicle offender cannot be compelled to sign the compounding slip, but be given a chance to face trial for compounding the offense. Both these path-breaking judgments serve as compelling example of the courts in safeguarding the rights of informed and aware citizens and how individuals can effectively seek redress for vindication of their rights through the legal system. It is said that great people start working on their plans much before the plan is to be put into execution. By the time Justice Datta learned about his proposed elevation as the Chief Justice of Bombay High Court, he was already on the ground, charged and running. He had his task cut out, all the impending important administrative decisions and the work culture in Bombay. By the time he drove into Washi Bridge, he was already prepared to face the mighty waves of the Arabian Sea. The decision to have a new building of Bombay High Court at Bandra Kurla complex was accelerated so much to be taken to logical conclusions only during his tenure, finally. On the administrative side, in a short stint of 31 months of Bombay High Court, Justice Datta played a pivotal role in upgradation of infrastructure in number of mafusil and civil courts of the state. He took a courageous decision of advancing the timings of Bombay High Court from 11 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. till 5 p.m. He was of the view that a public institution like courts cannot afford to be laid back in their functioning starting in the middle of the day, judges, as also every court staff, must be an early riser. On the judicial side also, Justice Datta has delivered a number of landmark verdicts. In the full bench judgment of Jalgaon Janta Sekari Bank Limited versus Joint Commission of Sales Tax, Mumbai and another, Bombay High Court, distinguishing the view taken by four other high courts, held that Section 26E of Safesi Act, introduced through the Amendment of 16, has a limited retrospectivity. When 
the crowns of the sovereign debt takes precedence over debts of the secured creditors or vice versa post enactment of non obstante clause under section 26c was succinctly explained in this judgment again there is an inspirational incident attached to this judgment the batch of around 50 writ petitions were heard for almost two weeks two weeks in succession with justice datta taking the lead role in drafting and preparation of the judgment the tone tenor and drafting of the judgment clearly shows reflects that it is authored by none else but by his lordship himself an evening before the judgment was to be pronounced both the brother judges of his lordship were surprised to discover that the judgment did not bear his name as the actual author at all it was a per curiam judgment that is judgment of the court and not by a particular judge as the author of its judgment both the judges insisted that because justice datta is in line for elevation to the supreme court he must reflect his name as the author to which his lordship categorically declined he told his brother judges in a very affectionate manner and i quote a true leader is one who always shares the fruits of success with his whole team and never keeps close it to himself this is what defines the persona of justice datta in the words of his brother judges at bombay he was never felt like a chief justice but as a head of the family getting everything done through the soft power of love and affection there was a defining moment in his life when he was in his early 20s being an avid cricket player from his childhood days justice datta in his formative years had two options before him either to opt for cricket or to have chosen law had he not been with us here he would have surely been playing for team india in a recently delivered speech at bombay he emphasized that a lawyer has a lot to learn from the game of cricket first being to take impromptu decisions while facing the court on his legs as a batsman you always think about the ball coming on your bat unmindful of the ball which is to be next you play the throw in the best way you can to survive for the next one likewise a lawyer should always give his best for the brief he is holding and deliver himself in a way that saves him for another another facet of justice datta's personality is his strong belief in intellectual victory whilst being in calcutta or bombay he gave sufficient leg room to every lawyer hearing them patiently however he would distinguish repel or overrule the submissions of the arguing counsel politely by quoting two three judgments to the contrary in a function held a year back a member of the bar at maharashtra explained the strait of his lordships comparing him to actor amitabh bachchan in the classical movies of 1980s amitabh bachchan in a classical style sitting on a round table would wait for everybody to open up their cards only to cut across everybody later with his three cards closely held to his chest There was a PIL filed in a Bombay High Court for direction to the state government for treating judges and judicial officers as frontline workers during COVID for vaccinating them on a priority basis. His lordships, while declining to entertain the PIL, remarked, "And I quote: Look, I am like the captain of a Titanic ship, last to leave when it is about to sink. All others have to be have to be evacuated first." being the captain here i should be the last to be vaccinated in the queue there is no question of claiming or asking for an upper hand for getting vaccinated during the pandemic when everybody needs it urgently the perception must stop that judges are preferred or the elite class but like any other but just must be treated like any other public servant sir the whole can family is truly honored to have you in the session today even though you sacrificed of your love for love of cricket for law please allow me that liberty to say so you will be no less than ms dhoni in the supreme court as also in today's session over to you sir for starting the address with a mark of salute thank you jai hind i would like to invite honorable justice datta now India Honorable Justice Geeta Mittal former chief justice High Court of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh the CS Vaidyanathan senior advocate Professor Dr S Surya Prakash vice chancellor of NLIU Bhopal Professor Uday Shankar 
Registrar of HNLU Raipur, distinguished members of the bar, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear students. A very good wet afternoon and warm greetings to one and all. It is indeed a moment of great pride and privilege for me to be a part of the third Justice H.R. Khanna Memorial Symposium organized by the Confederation of Alumni for National Law Universities to commemorate the colossal persona of late Justice H.R. Khanna. In the first session of the day, I had the pleasure of listening to my esteemed brother, Justice Sundresh, who spoke on state surveillance and privacy, the Lakshman Rekha between. Having observed his lordship's erudition and command over the subject, I will try to do justice with the topic on which I have been invited to deliver the keynote address, that is, legal stalwarts and their contributions to the modern Indian judicial system. While there are scores of legal stalwarts in India who deserve to be discussed in a seminar of the present kind, due to time constraints, I have chosen five legal stalwarts belonging to different fields of the legal world, but majorly from the judiciary, based on my personal choice. They have contributed to our judicial system in unique ways, and it is for them that our jurisprudence stands enriched and liberty for the common man remains guaranteed. But while speaking of legal stalwarts, how does one forget Justice H.R. Khanna himself? Before referring to the chosen five, I feel the urge to say a few words touching the life and works of Justice Khanna. Justice Khanna ensured upholding of the rule of law at all costs. No matter how dark the times or how uncertain the circumstances were, the far-sighted decisions rendered by Justice Khanna continue to have a huge impact on the evolution of Indian constitutional law, not only as precedents, but also guide all those constitutional functionaries who man the institutions of the modern Indian Republic. Justice Khanna's powerful dissent in the case of ADM Jabalpur, which is euphemistically referred to as the habeas corpus case, came at a time after an emergency was declared way back on 25th June, 1975. His Lordship was far-sighted enough to comprehend that the resultant effect of the dissent would cost him the coveted office of the Chief Justice of India. From his Lordship's autobiography, neither roses nor thorns, he divulged the same to his younger sister in the company of his wife in these words. And I quote, I have prepared a judgment which is going to cost me the Chief Justiceship of India. Unquote. There was a past instance of three senior judges of the Supreme Court being superseded for rendering judgments in the famous case of Peshavananda Bharati, much to the dislike of the ruling dispensation, and the judge, fourth in the order of seniority, was appointed as the Chief Justice of India. The case, as you know, gave birth to the basic structure doctrine, but the very same decision also resulted in supersession of judges, the first of its kind, and which was repeated a few years later when Justice Khanna was denied appointment as the Chief Justice of India. Having been superseded, Justice Khanna immediately resigned as a judge of the Supreme Court. However, the pledge taken towards a higher calling was far more important than the constitutional office of the Chief Justice of India. And Justice Khanna said, so ended my career on the bench. My career had its ups and downs, its doses of frustration, and moments of exaltation. Most of us, when elevated to the bench, have certain ideals, and we go there with certain mental commitments. It is like a pledge. 
not to some external authority, but to one's inner self, to one's conscience, and for those religious minded, to one's God. And it is at the altar of one's own conscience, in the eyes of one's God and inner self, that one would be ultimately answerable as to how far one has abided by one's commitment and pledge. Important though may be assessment of others, much more important than that is the verdict of one's own inner self on one's performance. Well, this is the sense of conviction that has come to define the legacy of Justice Khanna. There can possibly be no two opinions that the constitutional courts in India will continue to rely on the sacrosanct illumination that is provided by the basic structure doctrine. Just as sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants, the basic structure doctrine continues to be the sunlight, epitomizing good governance and enhancing transparency and accountability in governmental functions. If at all, any virus responsible for any attempt to tinker with the basic structure of the constitution raises its ugly head and upon such an attempt being put to the test of virus before our constitutional courts, the blazing sunlight that the said doctrine generates would be adequate to remove the incompatibility creeping into it and declared ultra virus. No wonder therefore that Justice Khanna was the scourge of the party in power. But to us, sensible citizens of the country, Justice Khanna is seen as the savior from the ruthlessness of the executive that was discerned during the 70s of the last millennium. I express my deepest regards, respect and reverence for Justice Khanna and move on to give you a glimpse of the contributions of some other legal stalwarts. I first start with Chief Justice Bijan Kumar Mukherjee, the fourth Chief Justice of India, whose portrait adorns the eastern wall of the Chief Justice's court. A great advocate, a greater judge, a scholar of profound wisdom, and a saint in the true sense of the term. Justice Mukherjee is a shining star in the legal firmament of the country. Whilst I have narrated the instances of the two formal cases of supersession of judges in recorded history, there was an instance where such supersession was averted within two years of establishment of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Senior advocate V. Sudhish Pai writes in his celebrated book, Legends in Law, Our Great Forebears, that on the death of Chief Justice H. L. Kanya in November 1951, the government intended to supersede Justices Patanjali Shastri and M.C. Mahajan and appoint Justice Mukherjee in their place as the Chief Justice of India on the ground that his lordship would have a longer tenure. While Justices Shastri and Mahajan were not averse to the idea, or they considered it appropriate that a person of Justice Mukherjee's caliber should be the Chief Justice, Justice Mukherjee was not agreeable and threatened to resign from the Supreme Court if he were appointed superseding justices Shastri and Mahajan. And the threat worked to great effect. The intended executive move was thwarted, and both justices Shastri and Mahajan, one after the other, held the office of the Chief Justice of India. Post retirement of Justice Mahajan, Justice Mukherjee rightfully assumed the office of the Chief Justice of India. Of the multiple masterly judgments spent by his lordship, K.C. Gajapati Narayan Deo discussed the doctrine of colorable legislation. Justice Mukherjee famously held that the said doctrine does not involve any question of bona fides or malafides on the part of a legislature. Rather, it resolves itself into the question of competency of a particular legislature to enact a particular law. It is as straightforward as this. If you, the legislature, have the power to legislate on a subject matter, bearing in mind the entries 
across the three lists in the seventh schedule, the legislation would pass judicial scrutiny. If you, the legislature, do not have the power, you cannot. Motive behind the passage of the legislation is a wholly irrelevant argument. The next judgment that comes to mind is the one in Rai Sahib Ram Jawaya Kapoor, where Chief Justice Mukherjee expounded on the form of our government and discussed separation of powers in the most elegant fashion. His Lordship held that, I quote, it may not be possible to frame an exhaustive definition of what executive function means and implies. Ordinarily, the executive power connotes the residue of governmental functions that remains after legislative and judicial functions are taken away." Unquote. In the Shirurmat case, His Lordship propounded the Hindu law of religious endowment in respect to Mats and Mahans, the power of taxation, and the idea of charge and tax. His decision in the case of Ratilal Panachat Gandhi may be considered the first to define the full breadth of the Constitution's protections for religious liberty. Chiranjit Lal Chaudhary and Anwar Ali Sarkar are decisions where the contours of right to equality under Article 14 and the doctrine of classification were enunciated. Among other opinions, all these judgments stand out as outstanding examples of judicial statements distinguished by profound erudition and clear explanation. The principles of law laid down by Justice Mukherjee have indeed stood the test of time and have well and truly enriched the system. The valuable contribution made by his lordship to the judicial system can never be forgotten. The next stalwart in my list is the 16th and the longest serving Chief Justice of India, Chief Justice Y.V. Chandrachur. Justice Chandrachur was admired throughout his tenure as a judge for his intellectual brilliance, scholarship, judicial vision, and craftsmanship. His Lordship's precise thinking, elegant expressions, commitment to justice, and courteous demeanor left a lasting impact. Around 400 reported judgments were rendered by his lordship, covering various branches of law. It is almost destiny that his lordship's tenure coincided with a critical period in India's judicial system. It appears as though a superior force acknowledged the requirement for judges with visionary intellect, erudition, and thoughtfulness in a young democracy like India. His Lordship's interpretation of Article 21 in an expansive fashion to ensure that the liberty of an individual is not compromised and that justice reached the disadvantaged sections of the society when all hopes seemed lost stands out from a host of judgments that were rendered. Speaking for the Constitution bench in Gurbak Singh, Sibya, on the law pertaining to anticipatory bail, it was held that Section 438 of the Code of Criminal Procedure must be liberally interpreted in the light of Article 21, and that to meet the test of Article 21, the procedure established by law for depriving a person of his liberty should be fair, just, and reasonable. Also, that the courts should lean against imposition of unnecessary restrictions. His Lordship's contributions underscored the evolution and application of the basic structure doctrine in Indian constitutional law, asserting the immutability of fundamental constitutional features against amendments. Justice Chandrachur captured its essence in Minerva Mills by stating, amend as you may, even the solemn document which the founding fathers committed to your care for you know best the needs of your generation, but the constitution is a precious heritage. Therefore, you cannot destroy its identity. Next, I refer to the decision in Dina alias Deen Dayal 
where the court was called upon to decide the validity of the mode of execution of death sentence as provided in section 354 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. The observations made by his lordship ought to be remembered by every judge when the courts are called upon to test the validity of a statute. His lordship observed, and I quote, this court is not a third chamber of the legislature. It has no such extraterritorial emissions and it does not aspire to do the job of outriders. It is simply the highest court of law and justice in a country governed by a written constitution, which in it is its primary and exclusive function to interpret. The care which we must take is that while interpreting the laws and the constitution, we ought not to be swayed by passing passions or by populist sentiments. We must do our duty by the constitution unaffected by extraneous considerations and guided solely by the obligation to be fair and just almost to a fault." Unquote. On the eve of his retirement, Chief Justice Chandrachur delivered the judgment for the Constitution bench in Olga Telis. Article 21 was invoked to rule that right to life would include a right to the means of livelihood, which make it possible for a person to live and that the procedure for eviction of pavement and slum dwellers must in the light of Article 21 be just, fair, and reasonable. It is perhaps remarkable that a mere sentence from the judgment in Olga Telis has so succinctly captured the entire jurisprudence on transformative constitutionalism, that is, bringing about change in society by infusion of values of equality, liberty, fraternity, and dignity. I quote, no individual can barter away the freedoms conferred upon him by the constitution. Just prior to the lunch, a student had asked me about what is transformative constitutionalism. Perhaps I have given him the answer, but for a better view of what transformative constitutionalism is, I would request my dear student to look into the judgments of Puttaswamy, Nafti Johar, N.M. Thomas, and Anuj Garg. We need not always focus on contribution of learned judges through their judgments. I will cite an example of His Lordship's unwavering commitment to fairness, as well as committee amongst courts at all levels. I recall the case of AKM Hassanu Zaman, where challenge to the electoral rules prepared by the State Election Commission was premised on the claim that legitimate voters were excluded and bogus voters included. Justice Shobushachi Mukherjee, as a judge of the Calcutta High Court, on the writ petition had issued rule and passed an addendum order as prayed. The said order was carried in appeal to the Supreme Court in appeal. Though a bench of three honorable judges felt disinclined to interfere since the High Court was seized of the issue, a request was made by the Supreme Court on the 23rd of February 1982, requiring Justice Mukherjee and none else to hear the petition on the 24th and decide it by the 25th. Justice Mukherjee could not decide the writ petition finally. Instead, confirmed the ad interim order by a reasoned order, but not without expressing his utter dismay faced with such an unusual request or direction. Justice Mukherjee had the courage to observe as follows, and I quote, in my limited experience as a judge of this high court for about 14 years, I have not known, read, or heard of such type of request or direction or expression of hope by the Supreme Court. I do not know how far this, again, be it a request, direction, or expression of hope is consistent either with the dignity of the judicial process or committee amongst courts and judicial functionaries. I hope that 
wiser heads in the future will decide, unquote. Such was the persona of Chief Justice Chandrachur that despite these strong observations made by Justice Mukherjee, and despite dismissal of the petition subsequently by the Supreme Court on 12 January 1983, by a constitution bench presided over by the Chief Justice in L.C. Sen, Justice Mukherjee was not only elevated to the Supreme Court two months later, on 15th March 1983 to be precise, during the regime of Chief Justice Chandrachur himself, but at a juncture which placed Justice Mukherjee on the road to Chief Justice ship in 1989. Whether and when we will see a larger hearted Chief Justice is known only to posterity. Talking of the contributions of Chief Justice Chandrachur, I can do no better than quote Chief Justice P. N. Bhagwati. His Lordship rightly said, a commitment to the legality of the laws and the procedural due process is the contribution of the Chandrachur court. I now move on to Chief Justice P. N. Bhagwati, who succeeded Chief Justice Chandrachur as the 17th Chief Justice of India. His Lordship's greatest legacy to this day remains the concerted efforts that resulted in introduction of the concept of public interest litigation and bringing the spotlight to the fundamental issue of legal aid in our modern republic. I commence with the latter facet first. I start with the decision in the landmark case of Suddhas. Suddhas, a government servant, was tried, convicted and sentenced to suffer imprisonment for two years for committing a crime. However, a fundamental flaw through the entire trial process was that Suddhas was not represented by any lawyer by reason of his inability to afford effective legal representation. Given that Suddhas was unrepresented, the bench led by Chief Justice Bhagwati found it to be a clear infraction of Article 21 and held his trial to be vitiated on account of a fatal constitutional infirmity and set aside the conviction and the sentence recorded against the appellant. Treating letter petitions as public interest litigation was the fusion of a novel idea of his lordship, one of the most significant contributions to the judicial system. Next, I would like to touch upon a landmark judgment delivered in the case of Ajay Hasia, where the court, speaking through Justice Bhagwati, established definitive criteria for assessing whether an individual, corporation, or society qualifies as a governmental instrumentality or agency, thereby determining its classification as a state within the meaning of Article 12. There are several decisions penned by his lordship which provide pivotal moments in the history of Indian jurisprudence, particularly concerning the vital question of fundamental rights and the scope of executive powers. In these judgments, Justice Bhagwati affirmed that the right to life and personal liberty was paramount of all the fundamental rights enshrined in the Constitution and could only be abridged by the state as per the procedure established by law. While in Manika Gandhi it was held that the right to travel abroad is a part of right to life, in Francis Corelli Mullen, his lordship observed that the right to life includes the detainee's right to confer with legal advisor and meet family and friends, and any unreasonable restriction in this regard would violate Articles 14 and 21. Furthermore, in the case of Bandhu Mukti Morcha, which dealt with the issue of bonded labor in India, his lordship categorically stated that bonded labor was a gross violation of fundamental rights while demanding immediate measures for the release and rehabilitation of bonded laborers and prescribing guidelines to prevent future occurrences of bonded labor. Bachan Singh was yet another case of constitutional importance dealt with by his lordship. Incidentally, Justices Chandrachur and Bhagwati shared the bench but differed on the ultimate conclusion. In this case, the constitutionality of death penalty was challenged and upheld. 
while Justice Chandrachur concurred with the majority opinion upholding death penalty authored by Justice R.S. Sarkaria, Justice Bhagwati wrote a powerful dissent for the ages. It was observed that the death penalty did not stand the test of Articles 14 and 21, and in cases such as death penalty, the court may refuse to presume its constitutionality and demand from the state the justification to establish its validity. Ultimately, his lordship declared it unconstitutional. With the change in global perceptions on death penalty, we do not know which of the two views would survive in the future. Both Chief Justices Shandachur and Bhagwati authored trailblazing judgments on constitutional law and their exposition of legal principles serve as lighthouses guiding judges while they are in the dark and sailing on the choppy waters of the oceans. Interestingly, in the years after the ADM Jabalpur case, Justices Shandachur and Bhagwati acknowledged that they were incorrect and expressed regret over the choices they made. One significant point that I wish to make here is this. I wonder if their lordships had accepted the minority view of Justice Khanna, whether the impetus to expand the jurisprudence on Article 21 in such a revolutionary way in the years following would have been there. In any event, the ill that was brought about by the majority view in the Indian Jabalpur case was remedied in fair measure by the subsequent decisions of their lordships, which without a doubt has led to a paradigm shift in the perception of judges while addressing fundamental rights issues. I conclude my address on Chief Justice Bhagwati by referring to what our former president, Sri Ramnath Kovinji said, According to Kovinji, Justice Bhagwati was an institution in himself who strived to expand the concept of justice and make justice that much more accessible to common people. Let me now change track. Mr. Nani Palkiwala, a person whose name evokes admiration and reverence and who is considered the embodiment of legal brilliance, is the next stalwart in my list. Mr. Palkiwala was not only a distinguished jurist who possessed a strong commitment to uphold constitutional liberties, but was also an expert in economics, allowing him a command over the subject, which enabled him to become one of the greatest tax lawyers our nation has ever produced. His original thinking, creative genius, and distinguished contribution are clearly reflected in the cases argued by him an acceptance of his arguments is a tribute to his scholarship and vision. Mr. Palkiwala had flawless pronunciation and an unparalleled flow of arguments. To quote again from Mr. Sudish Pai's book, Legends in Law, I quote, when he spoke, the air was still, the mute wonder lurked in men's ears to steal his sweet and honeyed sentences, unquote. Mr. Palkiwala's big break came very early in 1948 in the case of P. V. Rao, a case under the Bombay Land Acquisition Act 1948. As if destiny was waiting to show the world the capabilities of Mr. Palkiwala, he was told on the eve of hearing that he would be the arguing counsel for the case, despite only being a junior in the chamber. Mr. Palkiwala burned the midnight oil and came up with arguments that were not even mentioned in his rejoinder. His style of presenting arguments and understanding of the law persuaded the court to issue a writ of certiorari against the state government, the first of its kind in the country. At the end of the case, the Advocate General Mr. Amin told Mr. Palkiwala, I did not object to your presenting new arguments in your rejoinder because I could see you were building your career, unquote. During the 1960s, Mr. Palkiwala received a prestigious offer to become the Attorney General for India. While he initially accepted the offer, he later found himself grappling with self-doubt about his ability to fulfill the responsibilities of the position, 
as it would mean aligning himself with the government's policies. To him, it seemed to take away the sense of freedom to decide for himself. It must be said that central to Mr. Palkiwala's success was his steadfast commitment to his beliefs and his unwavering intellectual integrity. In 1975, when the Allahabad High Court overturned Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's election to the Lok Sabha on corruption charges, he agreed to defend her, even though he disagreed with many of her economic policies. This decision reflected his strong sense of commitment to justice. His decision to defend Mrs. Gandhi was because he firmly believed that the judiciary should not have the power to dismiss an elected member of parliament on what he considered to be insufficient legal grounds. However, when he learned shortly afterwards that Mrs. Gandhi had declared a state of emergency, he felt outraged. He perceived this action as a subversion of the constitution. Despite the personal risks that were involved, he made the courageous decision to withdraw as her lawyer. He spoke to the then law minister and famously told him, this is not negotiable. I'm only informing you of my decision. His involvement in the historic Kesavananda Bharati case is particularly noteworthy. The judgment can be said to be the highest point of Mr. Palkiwala's career and sets him apart from other great lawyers. The judgment is a celebration of India's constitution. It is a celebration of the upholding of the rule of law and the fine margins on which the case was decided. Demonstrate the quality of the lawyer that was required to tilt the case on the correct side. His advocacy in the case can be best summarized in the words of Justice H.R. Khanna, who remarked, and I quote, it was not none who, was spoke, who, who spoke, it was divinity speaking through him, unquote. Does a lawyer expect anything more? I think not. At this stage, I cannot resist but share a short anecdote from the case of Keshavananda Bharati. Though Mr. Palkiwala might have faced several legal challenges from the bench, he also had to encounter a slightly unique challenge. While arguing before the 13 judges bench, he was facing interruptions from the judges quite often, so much so that he was barely able to advance a proposition. He had the occasion to complain to Mr. C.K. Daftari, former Attorney General, who was appearing for one of the parties. Miraculously, after the ensuing weekend, Mr. Palkiwala did not face any major interruptions from the judges. It was later revealed that Mr. Daftari had met Chief Justice S.M. Sikri and happened to compliment him on the ongoing hearing. He then told the Chief Justice that a little girl had come to see the proceedings and innocently asked her father who that young man was who repeatedly kept interrupting the 13 well-dressed gentlemen. After Chief Justice Sikri got Mr. Daftari's message, all went smoothly with Mr. Palkiwala's submissions, and ultimately what the nation received was the basic structure doctrine. The fifth and final stalwart, stalwart in my list is Dr. Durgadas Basu. The first book on the constitution, which students of different generations have studied, was authored by Dr. Basu. Throughout the globe, the constitutional masterpieces authored by him have been remembered, referred to with respect, and warmly eulogized by the highest of authorities on both bar and bench. He was also awarded the honor of Padibhushan. What Blackstone, Koch, and Chancellor Kent were for the American and European jurisprudence, Dr. Basu was the same for Indian jurisprudence. Dr. Ambedkar, appreciating the literary work of Dr. Basu, said, It is not a mere reproduction of the articles of the Constitution. It is a real commentary in the sense that it does bring to the aid of the student 
analogous articles from other constitutions, and elucidation by foreign courts of the meaning of analogous terms and phrases, which it is difficult for Indians who are not familiar with them to understand and follow. It was also once said by Lord Denny in the honor of Dr. Basu that the Indian Republic has in Basu found its Cooley while referring to Thomas M. Cooley, former Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court. For the less discerning and uninitiated, Dr. Basu is perhaps the only great academic and jurist who had owned the high constitutional office of a judge of a high court. I take enormous pride in saying that I started my career as a judge of the high court, of which Dr. Basu was a judge during 1963 to 1971. An incident while he was a judge of the Calcutta High Court, which I have heard from high authority, is worth mentioning. A division bench of which Dr. Basu was the junior member had heard and reserved judgment in a complex matter. Thereafter, the senior judge read out his prepared judgment. At the end of it, Justice Basu dictated an extempore judgment, neatly covering all aspects of the case and with reference to all the relevant decisions. After the court rose, the senior judge embraced Justice Basu and asked him how it was possible for him to have done that. Justice Basu replied, and I quote, you brother read the law for this case. I have been reading it for a lifetime. I did not look at law only for the case, unquote. Truly scholarly. The first edition of Dr. Basu's commentary on the Constitution was published in November 1950, when hardly any decision of the Supreme Court on any article of the Constitution was rendered to assist the author in preparing, preparing his comments. The first edition was thus an exploration into unknown territory. Dr. Basu's commentary on the Constitution of India is regarded as an immortal creation of a rare genius. Number of judgments have been rendered by judges of the Supreme Court drawing guidance from such commentary. Dr. Basu's book on administrative law is also a treatise which I urge you all students to study while attempting to understand the subject. Apart from law, very few people know that Dr. Basu was also a great Sanskrit scholar, well versed in our ancient laws, and was also adorned adorned with various titles in that behalf. He was a deeply spiritual soul who also wrote, wrote books on comparative religion. He plowed a lonely furrow of scholarship and kept the sacred flame of knowledge trim and bright, leaving an imprint of his personality in our lives and will throughout continue inspire us. Each of these stalwarts have either rendered judgments or have assisted in rendering of judgments which have safeguarded the basic features of the constitution from time to time, whilst never losing sight of the core importance of the fundamental rights guaranteed under part three. It is because of these judgments that our jurisprudence has been enriched and the state of the modern Republic stands on a robust footing. I am reminded of John Monnet, the post war architect of European unity, who once famously wrote, and I quote, nothing is possible without men, but nothing is lasting without institutions, unquote. Men of character who have adorned our judicial institutions continue to dispense justice fearlessly and with a sense of purpose because these five distinguished jurists alongside Justice Khanna and many more, played their role and shaped these institutions for generations to come. I'll be failing in my duty if I do not acknowledge the contribution of those who assisted me in preparing this address. Much of the factual information shared by me is derived from Legends in Law, authored by Mr. Sudish Pai. I urge all students in the audience to read the book to acquaint themselves with our rich legal traditions so that in the future, you are well equipped to argue cases keeping in mind 
the long-lasting principles laid down by these great men. Father, I acknowledge the painstaking efforts of my law clerks, Pritham and Rishit, and the young research assistants at Can Foundation who have rendered invaluable assistance to me. I would also like to take this opportunity to appreciate the good work carried out by the wonderful team at Can Foundation. I am sure that the foundation will continue to take meaningful steps in making legal education more accessible to the marginalized section of our society. While winding up, I just wish to say this to all the students in the audience. The purpose of this lecture is not only for you to know the life and accomplishments of these stalwarts of yesteryears, but I do sincerely expect that in the times to come, some of you would reach the heights of such stalwarts and st stand tall like them. The lines of the famous Hindi song come to my mind. In saaf ki dagar par bacho dikhao chal ke, ye desh hai tumara, neta tumi ho kal ke. Expressing fervent hope that the lives of these stalwarts inspire you to be committed to justice and the rule of law, I conclude my address. Thank you for your patience. Jai Hind and Namaskar. Thank you, Justice Deepak Prata. I want to take this opportunity to express my deep appreciation and gratitude to the Honorable Justice Deepak Datta for his enlightening and thought-provoking discourse on the esteemed legal stalwarts and their invaluable contributions to modern Indian judicial system. Justice Deepak Datta, your presence here today and your extensive knowledge of the legal landscape have truly enriched our understanding and remarkable uh, of the remarkable individuals who have shaped the course of Indian jurisprudence. Your eloquence and passion for the subject have captivated our minds, leaving a lasting impression on each and every one of us. I want to express my sincere gratitude for shedding light on the remarkable contributions of Justice H.R. Khanna, whose unwavering commitment to justice and upholding the rule of law during one of India's darkest hours serves as an enduring testament to his indomitable spirit. His courage in the face of adversity and his resolute belief in the principles of justice, principles of justice have become an inspiration for generations to come. Furthermore, I want to extend my heartfelt appreciation to Justice Dipanga Datta for sharing insights into the illustrious careers of Justice Vaivy Chandrachur. As the Chief Justice of India, his profound understanding of constitutional principles and his landmark judgments have played a pivotal role in shaping the development of Indian jurisprudence. Nani Palkiwala, a towering figure in the legal fraternity, has left an indelible impact on the modern Indian judicial system. His relentless pursuit of justice, his mastery of constitutional law, and profound commitment to safeguarding fundamental rights have earned him a place of reverence among legal scholars and practitioners. I want to express my deepest gratitude to, this, to Justice Dipanga Datta for highlighting the invaluable contributions of this ex exceptional legal luminary. Moreover, Justice Dipanga Datta, your comprehensive discourse on Justice P. N. Bhagwati and his pioneering efforts in establishing the principles of public interest litigation has opened our eyes to the transformative power of judicial activism. His groundbreaking judgments have empowered the marginalized and provided a voice to voiceless, thereby making the judicial system more accessible and inclusive. Last but not the least, I want to acknowledge the invaluable contributions of uh, Justice D.D. Basu, whose seminal work on the commentary on the Constitution of India has become a beacon of knowledge for legal practitioners, scholars, and students. His meticulous research and lucid explanation of constitution principles have nurtured a deeper understanding of our constitutional framework and have become an essential reference for anyone seeking clarity on matters of constitutional law. Uh, lastly, I want to commend Justice Dipanka Datta for his own contribution and outstanding contribution to the legal fraternity. Your distinguished career and dedication to upholding justice have earned you the respect and admiration of your peers and the legal community at large. Your unwavering commitment to the principles of fairness, equity, and constitutional values is an inspiration to all of us. In conclusion, I want to express my deepest gratitude to Justice Dipanga Datta for his enlightening discourse on these legal stalwarts and their contribution to the modern Indian judicial system. Your presence here today has added immense value to this symposium and your expertise and insights have inspired us to strive for more and just and equitable society. 
Thank you once again, sir. We are truly grateful for your invaluable contribution to this symposium. May we carry the forward the legacies of these legal luminaries and continue to work towards a judicial system that upholds the principles of justice, equal, equality, and fairness for all. Uh, I would now like to introduce, uh, I'd like to call upon uh, Shriram Parakkat uh, to take over. Uh, Thank you, Rajat. After that scintillating first session and the expectation for the uh, second session, I'm sure the lunch break was more of food for thought than food itself. While the first session addressed a topic which centers around competing interests, one of constitutional rights of privacy, the rights of personal autonomy, and the other interest of the unending march of technology. While the former topic the mind of the legal professional, judges, lawyers, everyone, lawmen in general, was challenged to strike a balance. Our distinguished speakers did far more than strike a balance. They've opened our avenues for far more research and far more thought. The topic for the second half comparatively, in my view, is one of convergence. Convergence between various fields of law, convergence between various forms of talent in law, Convergence of different time frames that are all to be seen while we grapple with this topic. Legal stalwarts and their contribution to legal system. Words of judges, their decisions become law. They become law of the land. Therefore, they speak at once to the present and to the future. Judges are remembered perhaps not only for the text of law, but for the context in which they wrote these judgments. This is what we got to learn from this Honorable Justice Divanga Datta's speech. The judgments are drawn in with immense contribution from lawyers who assisted the courts. And therefore, behind every celebrated the judgment, there is a lawyer to be celebrated and remembered. The traditions of preservation of knowledge in the Upanishads are not merely in the written form, but as an oral tradition. And therefore, anecdotes have helped us to bind ourselves to that tradition. The wisdom of judges and lawyers are not limited to the binding judgments they present to the posterities, but also in the most interesting stories about their life, which we get a glimpse of only from sessions like this. The stalwarts about whom our distinguished speakers have spoken and are about to speak, we are excited to expect the anecdotes from the bar, the bench from different time frames those of whom have contributed in many ways in terms of erudition, courage, integrity, and some wit. On behalf of Cannes Foundation, I thank all the distinguished panelists. I would also request that a PowerPoint presentation about our foundation, about our achievements, about our dreams be presented. Uh, I wish the PowerPoint be started.
May I invite Archana Patak, ma'am, to carry on the session? Namaskar. Today, I, Archana Patak Dave, advocate on record, Supreme Court, is here before you to speak about a remarkable individual who has made immense contributions to the field of law and has been a beacon of hope for countless individuals seeking justice. I am honored to talk about Justice Geeta Mittal. Justice Geeta Mittal is a name that resonates with integrity, compassion, and unwavering commitment to the cause of justice. Throughout her illustrious career, she has exemplified the highest standards of professionalism and has left an indelible mark on the Indian judicial system. Justice Mittal has been a pillar of strength and mentor for Can Foundation. It is due to her continued guidance and support that the Can family is able to successfully achieve the purpose for which it is formed. Justice Mittal was educated at Lady Irwin School in Delhi, graduating in 1975. She went on to obtain a Bachelor of Arts in Economics with honors from the Lady Sri Ram College for Women, Delhi in 1978, and also participated actively in athletics, acting as sports president of the Lady Sri Ram College. Justice Mittal studied law at the Campus Law Center in Delhi, graduating with LLB in the year 1981. Born with a passion for justice, Geeta Mittal embarked on her journey as a lawyer, determined to make a difference in society. Her dedication, and legal acumen quickly earned her recognition, leading to her appointment as a district and session judge in the year 2004. Since then, there has been no turning back for her. Justice Mittal was appointed an additional judge to the Delhi High Court on 16 July 2004 and was confirmed as a permanent judge on 20th February 2006. During her tenure as a High Court judge, Justice Mittal served on a number of administrative and judicial committees of the court. She was the chair of the Delhi High Court's Mediation and Conciliation Center and served on committees that dealt with complaints concerning sexual harassment, working condition, performance assessment of judges in subordinate courts and judicial training. Justice Mittal also served on a committee concerning the implementation of legal guidelines that govern child witnesses in cases concerning sexual offenses. As part of this, she led an initiative to establish special courtrooms for vulnerable witnesses in the Delhi High Court, with the first such courtroom being established in the year 2012. On 14th April 2017, Justice Mittal was appointed as the Acting Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court. On 3rd August 2018, Justice Geeta Mittal was appointed as the Chief Justice of the High Court of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. She is the first woman Chief Justice of that court. She retired on 8 December 2020. On 25 October 2019, Justice Mittal authored a significant judgment in Sohail Rashid Bhatt versus State of Jammu Kashmir, striking down the Jammu and Kashmir Prevention of Beggary Act 1960 a law drawing from colonial legal principles to penalize poverty and public movement. Along with Justice Rajesh Bindal, she held that criminalization of beggary violated constitutional principles and constituted a disproportionate infringement of the right to meaningful life, dignity, privacy, and liberty guaranteed under Article 21. Justice Geeta Mittal is a highly esteemed an accomplished judicial figure in India. She has made significant contributions to the legal field through her extensive experience and expertise. Virendra Singh versus State, where Justice Mittal outlined the causes for inability of the state authorities to ensure protection of rape and other vulnerable victims and witnesses, and laid out a scheme through directions about setting up of courts, specially acute and geared to ensure that the victims are not traumatized and at the same time assured their protection during the course of trial. The success of the first of such centers was replicated with the creation of similar such centers in numerous court complexes. 
the Delhi High Court Bar Association versus Government of NCT Delhi 2013, which outlawed as unconstitutional upward revision of court fees as impeding access to justice. In 2011, along with Justice Midha, she passed a significant ruling concerning the rights of transgender individuals holding that a woman with a congenital hormonal anomaly had been unfairly discriminated against when she was prohibited from joining the Shashastra Seema Bal, a border patrol organization as a female constable. In 2018, she held that advertisements prohibiting women from applying for recruitment to the Indian Territorial Army violated the Territorial Army Act 1948, which allows men and women to apply. Justice Geeta Mittal's involvement in establishing the Sakhi Suraksha Advanced DNA Forensic Laboratory has had a significant positive impact on the processing of sexual assault cases in Delhi. From her role as a district and session judge to her tenure as the Chief Justice of the Jammu and Kashmir High Court, Justice Geeta Mittal has consistently toward, worked towards promoting justice, peace, and harmony. Her contributions have extended beyond the courtroom as she has been actively involved in initiatives to improve legal services and enhance access to justice for all. Throughout her career, she has been known for the dedication to justice, fairness, and upholding the rule of law. She has received numerous accolades and recognition for her exceptional work. She has been honored with Exceptional Women of Excellence Award by the Women Economic Forum. In 2008, Justice Mittal was awarded the Distinguished Alumna Award from Lady Shriram College. In 2019, she received the Justice P. N. Bhagwati Award for her contributions toward improving access to justice and for her work in designing and introducing special courts for vulnerable, vulnerable victims in the Delhi High Court. These accolades are a testament to her unwavering commitment to justice and her tireless efforts to uplift the society. Justice Mittal also serves on the Editorial Advisory Board of the National Law University Delhi's Journal of Legal Studies. The Delhi High Court has appointed Justice Geeta Mittal as a chairperson for the Committee of Administrators to conduct the affairs of the Table Tennis Federation of India. She has also been appointed as the first woman chairperson of the Broadcasting Content Complaints Council. Justice Geeta Mittal's contribution to the field of justice have been exemplary and her impact on society will be felt for years to come. I'm honored to welcome ma'am for her address. Thank you, Archana. Honorable Justice Dipankar Gupta, Mr. C.S. Vaidyarathan, Professor Vivekanandan, Professor Uday Shankar, Mr. Siddharth Gupta, other judges who may have joined the program on video conferencing, vice chancellors, members of faculties, office bearers and supporters of CAN, students and all other guests present in the auditorium who have joined virtually. My heartiest greetings from Delhi to all of you. I am grateful to Siddharth Gupta and his entire team for giving me this opportunity to speak on a subject which is very, very dear to my heart. We have had the benefit of hearing Justice Dibankar Gupta who has spoken so eloquently about, the, about Justice H.R. Khanna's achievements and the colossal persona that he was, not only in the judicial world, but also in life, as well as the other legal luminaries, legal stalwarts, and their contributions to the evolution of jurisprudence. I see from the topic that I, we, I'm called upon to speak on legal, female legal stalwarts and their contributions to more, the modern Indian judicial system. So far as women are concerned, the female stalwarts that I will address, uh, I have found in my research, which I've been doing over the period of years, that women have faced so many barriers, the glass ceiling is so low for them, that most of their time and effort and energy has gone into breaking 
breaking the glass ceiling and overcoming the barriers to reach their positions as stalwarts. And between each progressive step, there are decades of effort by other women who have struggled. So I am going to talk not more about the, not too much about the contribution to jurisprudence, but to how they have contributed and ensured the growth and progress of women in the Indian judicial system. And I will be looking at not only the lawyers, but also the contribution of women made to the drafting of the Indian constitution. So we are all aware that the legal profession has historically been male or dominated from being allowed to study law as a subject with male counter counterparts to being able to practice as advocates and rising through the ranks to become judges. Women were, have been forced to find creative ways to become equal members of this profession, which was meant for the privileged few. Today, as we delve into the lives and contributions of female lawyers and judges in India, whose remarkable stories continue to inspire generations, it is important to note their overall contributions to the legal field, to understand the importance of having more women at both the bar and the bench, spearheading change. Yes, I am using this opportunity to speak to all of you to uh, promote what is also very essential, that is equality in opportunities, judicial uh, in uh, opportunities, both in the bar and at, on the bench. Let's first look at for the first female lawyers and their contributions. Despite the efforts of these brilliant women, lack of gender diversity in the Indian legal fraternity continues to be, in the, be the norm. When it comes to the bench, less than 10% of the Supreme Court justices and only 13% of the judges in the high courts across the country are women. The highest number of female judges at 35% is to be found in the district judiciary. The bar tells an equally dismal story with the data provided last year by the Department of Legal Affairs pointing towards only 15.31% of enrolled advocates from 15 states being women. It is important to bear in mind that even these abysmal numbers were only achieved due to the struggle of iconic figures who we are calling stalwarts today across generations. In this, one must pay homage to Cornelia Sorabji, who shattered barriers, barriers and blazed a trail for women in the legal profession. Born in 1866, she was the first woman to graduate from Bombay University with a first class degree in literature and went on to study law at Oxford University by receiving special permission by the Congregational Decree However, she was not allowed to practice before the bar as a barrister. Despite this hurdle, Cornelia Sorabji found a way to help over 600 women and orphans by being appointed as a lady assistant to the court of wards of Bengal. Her re remarkable achievements inspired generations of women to overcome societal constraints and pursue their dreams to be part of the legal profession. Her journey was not an isolated incident but part of a larger movement of pioneering women who defied societal norms. Regina Guha was another such woman who after completing her MA in 1913 and a Bachelor of Laws in 1916 from Calcutta University, submitted an application to be enrolled as a pleader of the court of the district judge of Alipur. Her application was forwarded to the Calcutta High Court where a five judge bench unanimously decided that only men are entitled to be admitted as pleaders. Unfortunately, Regina then decided to follow an alternative career as headmistress and subsequently principal of the Jewish girls school in Kolkata. But her petition became the foundation that enabled Dr. Hari Singh Gaur, a member of the Central Legislative Assembly to move a bill in 1924 to end this discrimination once and for all. The amendment had to be effective to the then uh, applicable Advocates Act, which prohibited women. These early pioneers showcased tremendous courage and resilience, setting the stage 
for subsequent generations of women in the legal field. So how did we get female judges and what has been their contributions? The much needed change in the composition of the Indian judiciary only came in 1937. So amendment to the Advocates Act was in the, after 1924. 1937, we get the first woman judge. That was Justice Anna Chandi, who came, became the country's first Munsit. That is the first female judge in Kerala. In 1948, she was promoted to the position of district judge. And subsequently, she became the first female High Court just, judge, Justice, when she was appointed to the Kerala High Court in 1959. You will find it really surprising that it took the Supreme Court another 30 years to get its first female judge, Justifa, Justice Fatima Bibi. And her appointment has been monumental towards the push of for gender diversity in all areas of the legal profession. We then also have in between Justice Leela Seth, who was appointed the first woman as the Chief Justice of the uh, High Court in India. The achievements of Justice Anna Chandi, Justice Fatima Bibi, Justice Leela Seth were not merely personal triumphs. They were catalysts for change. They paved the way for extraordinary judges like Justice Indu Malhotra, who was the first female judge to be directly elevated to the Supreme Court from the bar due to her illustrious career. I was in the bar when Justice Ruma Pal came to the Supreme Court from the High Court of Kolkata. And I remember what the men used to say, that she was the, one, she was the best man amongst all the judges. We are also aware of the contribution being made by women judges as of now. Justice Pratibha M. Singh, who is a sitting judge at the Delhi High Court, has managed to not only carve a niche for herself through her achievements in the intellectual property law, but also has shaped the judiciary's treatment of the cases on the same by spearheading the abolishment of intellectual property appellate board. Instances like these gal are, are extremely relevant and uh, present all across, across the country. We are also aware of Justice Mukta Gupta's contribution in the field of criminal law, who has just retired on the 28th of June. Coming now to the role of women in drafting of the Indian constitution, representation of women both at the bar and the bench is not a tokenistic gesture. At the cost of sounding pompous, we must discuss the incredible contribution made by female judges and several incredible female lawyers in expanding legal rights and upholding our constitutional values. For starters, the Indian legal fraternity owes a debt of gratitude to the women who were members of the Constituent Assembly of India, the body responsible for drafting the Constitution of, women, of India. These women included women as Hansa De Jivraj Mehta, Dakshayani Velayudhan, Ammu Swaminathan, and Begum Aizaz Rasul, who played a pivotal role in shaping the fundamental rights and principles enshrined in our constitution and ensured that gender equality, justice, and rights of the minorities were at the core of the legal framework. A memorable anecdote reveals the kind of onslaughts women activists like Dr. Hansa Mehta would have had to endure. In her final session at the Constituent Assembly, another member, R.C. Choudhury, remarked that the Assembly had made no provisions for, I quote, protection of women, unquote, and the protection against women, unquote, and that women were trying to and these are his words, elbow out men in every sphere. To this, Dr. Hansa Mehta replied, and I quote, the world would have thought very little of the men if they had asked for protection against women in this constitution, unquote. These remarkable women were not only involved in the shaping of the Indian legal profession, but their efforts were also recognized internationally, allowing them to shape international legal frameworks and policies. For instance, 
Cornelia Sorabji, India's first woman advocate, was a member of the International Council of Women and actively contributed to global discussions on women's rights. And Dr. Hansa Jibraj Mehta was the Indian delegate to the United Nations Human Rights Commission and found herself serving as vice chair of the commission. Her most memorable contribution is to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Here she was she successfully fought for the rephrasing of the term. I quote, all men are born free and equal, unquote. It was changed to, I quote, all human beings are born free and equal, unquote. This was such an important contribution made by the, uh, the Indian delegate, that too, the Indian woman delegate, that is Dr. Hansa Jibraj Mehta. There have been general contributions as well of female legal practitioners in improving the legal system, which have greatly enabled better access to the justice delivery system. Female stalwarts in the Indian legal profession have made significant contributions to promoting gender equality through their involvement in landmark cases. These cases have addressed issues such as rights, gender-based violence, workplace discrimination, and equal access to justice. Their tireless efforts have resulted in groundbreaking judgments that have reshaped our legal landscape. However, the contributions of these women extend far beyond gender-specific legal issues. Their dedication and commitment to upholding the principles of justice and fairness have strengthened the rule of law in India and ensured equal, if not better, access to justice to the, to the country as a whole, to the persons accessing the legal system in India. Another such example in more recent times is the remarkable work done by Ms. Indira Jaising. Her relentless pursuit of justice and commitment to human rights has had a profound impact on the legal fraternity. As a prominent lawyer, she has championed causes related to women's rights, LGBTQ plus, plus rights, and access to justice for marginalized communities, which have been instrumental in bringing about systemic changes in India. Many of you may not know that Indra Jaising, as part of the committee, was, has contributed greatly to the drafting of the Convention of, of Elimination of Discrimination all forms of discrimination against women, that is CEDAW, which has also led to the enactment of the domestic violence law in India. We are also known, in fact, the Indian judiciary is celebrated the world over for the path-breaking pronouncement in which known as the Vishaka judgment, which was authored by Justice J. S. Verma, wherein he laid down guidelines as to how cases of sexual harassment had to be dealt with, which it, it took decades before the, which could be translate into a law relating to sexual harassment. The lawyer in this case was Minakshi Aroda, the senior advocate of the Supreme Court of India. So what is the importance of gender diversity in the legal field? You know, we have to ensure this kind of diversity if we are going to take an assessment or evaluate the contribution by legal stalwarts to the Indian judicial system. The contributions of these women, these few women that I have called out for today's discussion have been instrumental in making India and the Indian legal fraternity what it is today. And it depicts the need for gender diversity and equality. Gender diversity in the legal fields leads to inclusive decision-making. It ensures that a broader range of perspectives and experiences are considered when interpreting and applying the law. It ensures that stereotypes and biases are bro broken down. For instance, the prejudice that, that women can only perform certain roles, you know, the bias against the worth and value of a, a, a homemaker. By embracing diverse viewpoints, we enhance the quality and fairness of judgments and foster public trust in our legal system. 
A balanced judiciary reflecting the demographics of a society is crucial for maintaining the credibility and legitimacy of our legal institutions. Gender diversity in the judiciary is not only a matter of justice, but it is also a reflection of the society we serve. It is essential that the judiciary, as well as the bar, represents the diverse voices and experiences of the citizens. I would like to share a story that I heard from Chief Justice Beverly McLachlan. She was the longest standing Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. And she quotes an experience in the trial courts when she said in a courtroom, a man, male defendant was marched in. And the man looked so nervous, he was shaking. And she was compelled to ask him if he was all right. If not, what was the matter? She said, trembling with fright, the man uttered, I feel completely overwhelmed and outnumbered. So she asked him why. So the gentleman defendant asked the judge to look around the room and see what was the, what were the demographics in the room. The judge said she found that the judge was a woman, the court staff was a woman, the prosecutor was a woman, the man's lawyer was a woman and she, he had been marched in by a woman police officer. So this was the, how a male felt when he was marched into a courtroom which had only women. Let us put ourselves in the shoes of a woman litigant who is every day marched into rooms which are occupied only by males. I've looked at every panel discussion and it is, I find it very heartening when you find more than one woman on the panel. You know, you find tokenism in every aspect of the field and a lot of it uh, is to be seen even in the way we have addressed equality in the judiciary. You must all be aware of and must, must recollect the famous quote of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the judge of the Supreme Court of the US who always advocated for appointment of more women to the bench of the Supreme Court of the United States. When she was asked, when would you be satisfied judge as to how many women have to be appointed before you would be satisfied? And her answer was seven. Now seven is the full strength of the su Supreme Court of United States of America. You know, the contribution made by women judges across the globe has been phenomenal. You know, I remember at one point of time, eight countries had women chief justices. The United Kingdom has had Chief Justice Brenda Hale, you know, that apart from that, uh, we are the, the, you see, the history is replete with instances internationally of women being appointed to the highest positions and making a most valuable contribution. I would also like to share with you a huge contribution made by a judge from South Africa, Justice Navanitam Pillay. She was a judge of a high court of the, uh, of South Africa who has faced apartheid seen discrimination firsthand and we could not even get a job because the women were not women lawyers were not employed and certainly not a colored woman lawyer in the south african courts and systems she was the first woman lawyer in south africa to set up her own firm she also defended nelson president nelson mandela in his cases on several human rights issues she took up causes in south africa she was appointed to the famous Rwanda Tribunal. Those of you who have uh, been following it, it's a, it's a very important tribunal. But uh, when she found the tremendous, the use of rape as an instrument of subjugation of an entire tribe, she was able to persuade the entire tribunal and they pronounced the law that use of rape as an instrument to subjugate the will of an entire community tantamounts to genocide. See, unfortunately, genocide is not an offense in the Indian Penal Code, but this was the con great contribution made by a woman judge. And uh, later on, she went on to be the uh, United Nations Human Rights Commissioner for two terms and made very valuable contribution. So this is the, it's a, it's very important to ensure that you have the viewpoint and we ensure uh, opportunities for women to make a contribution, not only on the bench, but certainly definitely in the profession and also ensure 
that women have equal access in the um, uh, legal education field. So what should be the road ahead? Uh, I will uh, take some time to deal with this aspect. Despite the progress made, there are several challenges that hinder female participation in the legal system. Many of these challenges have been fought by the women, the stalwarts who I have cited. These challenges include gender bias and discrimination, stereotyping, societal expectations, lack of support systems, ignorance of the law, work-life balance issues, limited access to mentorship and networking opportunities, and certainly unequal career growth opportunities. You know, I quoted the figure with regard to the higher percentage of women judges in the district judiciary. That is largely because the system emanates, the selection process emanates from a very clearly defined process of an examination and interview coupled with their standing in their academics. You see, where the, where the so there women have a level playing field and are able to make a, a substantial inroads into the appointments into the system. There is a dire need to first and foremost acknowledge the challenges that hamper women from entering the legal profession and being able to make the same career progress as the male counterparts. There is also a need to make substantial changes and I will just enumerate some of them. The first change that I would advocate is enhancing access to legal education and addressing barriers that address hinder that, that hinder women's access to legal education, such as financial constraints, social norms, and biases. This can be achieved by providing targeted scholarships, mentoring programs, and awareness campaigns to encourage more women to pursue legal education. Another significant step would be to find some way of ensuring a payment of a stipend for the first two or three years of practice, which really needs to be done. And I advocated this both as a lawyer and later when I became a judge of the High Court of Delhi as well. The second step would be creating, in, creating work life balance initiatives and recognizing the unique challenges faced by women in balancing professional and personal responsibilities. Most adult women in India facing social, face social expectations of marriage and family and find litigation as a career more difficult to pursue in the long term. Furthermore, the eligibility requirements, and this is very important, for the direct recruitment examination for the district judge cadre, which is seven years continuous practice and an age band of 35 to 45 years, and then to be considered for direct elevation to the high court bench, that is minimum 10 years of practice as an advocate before the high court, directly impact women's participation and their chances of rising to the higher judiciary. It is essential that flexible work arrangements like virtual hearings, parental leave policies, like relaxation of the need for continuous practice as an eligibility criteria and child care support, support like crashes in the court complexes are provided to enable women to thrive in their legal careers. I may point out here that it's wherever lawyer women whether as lawyers or judges have taken the initiative that we have been able to create creches and uh, you know child care facilities in the courts to en ensure some level of a facility to enable a woman to carry on either with the judicial work or with her legal practice. The third suggestion that I would make is establishing mentorship programs that connect aspiring women lawyers with experienced professionals to provide guidance, support, and opportunities for professional development. Women as judges. This can be achieved through transparent and merit-based selection processes, sensitization programs for the judiciary, and ensuring equal opportunities for women to serve as judges. It is disappointing that there have been only 11 female court justices, Supreme Court justices, 
since its, its establishment in 1950. We must ensure objective criteria for evaluating the work of women, either as lawyers or as judges for effecting their appointments. Lastly, promoting and implementing gender sensitive policies that address gender bias, discrimination and harassment within the legal profession, as well as the special needs of women, permitting them flexi hours, you know, giving their power, accepting that a woman lawyer will need a break in the profession to, you know, whether it is to have children, whether it is to take care of a sick in laws, etc. And factoring that, that into the requirement of the seven year continuous practice for appointment as a district judge or 10 years as a high court judge. This includes the mechanisms to report and address instances of discrimination, providing support system for women and ensuring equal opportunities for career growth. So as we conclude this tribute to female stalwarts in the Indian legal profession, let us reflect on their remarkable achievements, courage, and unwavering commitment to justice. They have left an indelible mark on our legal system and continue to inspire future generations. Their stories remind us of the importance of striving for a more inclusive legal profession that embraces diversity, gender equality and equal access to justice. It is our collective responsibility to create an environment that enables all individuals, regardless of gender, to excel in the pursuit of justice. As we embark on the journey ahead, let us embrace the future with a renewed commitment to diversity and equality in the legal field so that we are more stalwarts who, in the legal field, who make even larger contributions to the judicial system than by those who have done so far. By doing so, we will create a legal system that truly reflects the values and aspirations of a great nation. I end by thanking Cannes Foundation once again for this uh, beautifully conceptualized webinar and, thank, and my great gratitude for giving me this opportunity to be part of the webinar. Thank you very much, Archie. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, you, you reminded us about the women lawyers and advocates as catalysts for changes. In fact, uh, in the words of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the former Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, I quote, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. It shouldn't be that women are the exception. You also talked about Justice Leela Seth, Justice Rumapal, Justice Indu Malhotra, Ms. Anna Chandy, and their contributions in the field of law. In fact, uh, the road ahead with which you have suggested will ensure that there are, there, are immense, there are immense women who are there in the field so that we have uh, the, the gender disparity that we have today can be taken care of. In fact, at the moment in the Supreme Court, as an advocate on record, when we are practicing, uh, the, uh, the situation is, is much brighter. We see a lot of young women advocates now coming up, arguing their cases, and we see absolutely no difference when the judges, when we are arguing as women lawyers and the judges are dealing with our cases. So I, I believe that the same thing also resonates in the entire country across all high courts across all district courts. Uh, I'm very thankful, ma'am, for giving us your time today and also to enlighten the young students to take up litigation, to be a part of this profession. Thank you very much, ma'am, on, on behalf of the Can Foundation. May I now request Mr. Swarnendu Chatterjee to kindly take over. Mr. Chatterjee, you are you have to unmute. Thank you, thank you, Archana, ma'am. Uh, okay. So I'll be introducing a, a senior advocate, C. S. Vaidyanathan, sir. So this is I am Swarnendu Chatterjee, advocate on record, Supreme Court of India. Today we have all gathered here for the symposium in the memory of a great judge of the Honorable Supreme Court, and it gives me immense pleasure to introduce none other than Mr. C.S. Vaidyanathan, Senior Advocate 
a legal luminary with more than 45 years of experience. Sir had completed his primary education in Tamil Nadu and his BSc from St. Joseph's College, Bangalore. In 1969, Mr. Vajjanathan, sir, graduated with a bachelor's degree in law from the Madras Law College. Pursuant to that in 1970, sir completed his master's in social work from National Institute of Social Sciences, Bangalore, and started working at the DCM Chemical Works in Delhi. At the beginning of his legal career, he's worked at the reputed chambers of late Mr. Nabiar, and thereafter, he started working under the aegis of, and in the chambers of Mr. K.K. Venigopal, the former Attorney General for India in Madras, now Chennai, and subsequently moved to Delhi in 1979. In the same year, Sir was designated as an advocate on record with the Supreme Court, and thereafter he was designated as a senior advocate in 1992 by the Honorable Supreme Court. Throughout his illustrious career, Sir has traveled extensively, both within India and abroad, attending international conferences of prestigious organizations such as International Bar Association, UIA, World Judiciary Association, Law Asia, and Circ Law. From 1997 to 2000, Sir served as a consular the president, advisor to the president of the UIA, exemplifying his dedication to fostering international cooperation and promoting the rule of law. Furthermore, Sir has held the esteemed position of regional secretary for South Asia in, in the UIA from, 2000, from the year 2000 onwards, furthering his commitment to strengthening legal ties with the region. With a career spanning across various courts and tribunals, Sir has firmly established himself as a prominent figure in the legal landscape. While his primary focus lies in the esteemed Supreme Court of India and the Honorable High Court of Delhi, he regularly appears before various high courts, various tribunals like TDSAT, the Honorable Appellate Tribunal for Electricity, the APTL, the NCDRC, and the National Appellate Company Law Tribunal in CLAT. Notably, he has appeared before the Justice Verma Commission and the Justice Jain Commission of Inquiry on the assassination of, of our late Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi for the Tamil Nadu Police. He continues to appear extensively in various high courts. Moreover, Mr. Vaidyanathan's illustrious career encompasses significant engagements in the realm of arbitration, including international commercial arbitration and international arbitration also. His invaluable contributions as a law officer of the Government of India during 1998 and 1999, when he was appointed as the Additional Solicitor General of India, um, by the Government of India, there, he had appeared in sensitive matters and important matters, including high-value taxation issues. Notably, Sir has also appeared in several inter-river state water disputes, including those involving the Kaveri River, Ravi, Bias, Narmada, Vasundara, Krishna rivers. His appearance in election symbol disputes and disqualification cases has further cemented his position as a highly respected legal professional. Sir's unwavering commitment to this profession has been evident in his representation of the deity Ram Lalla in the historic Ram Janabhumi case. He also appeared for the petitioner in the Ram Setu case. Additionally, Sir had argued for the inclusion of Sanskritam as a subject in all CBSC schools. It is with great admiration that we acknowledge the remarkable achievements of Mr. Vaidyanathan through his worst experience, unwavering commitment to justice and profound understanding of law. He has left an inevitable mark on the legal fraternity. Let us applaud his remarkable contributions and extend our heartfelt appreciation for his tireless pursuit of truth, justice, and the rule of law. I hand over the stage to Sir for his speech. Good evening. This is uh, Deepanka Dattal. This is uh, Gita Mittal. Fellow panelists dignitaries and distinguished friends, young lawyers and students. It's a very late evening, a wet evening as the sister Gata mentioned earlier. We have had the excellent presentation on very eminent jurists by Justice Dutta. And Justice Gita Mittal has spoken about several eminent lady lawyers, judges, and members of Constituent Assembly. As the last speaker, I don't want to take too much time, but 
there are persons in the audience who are, as Justice Dutta mentioned, hopefully will become active advocates addressing the courts and rise up to become jurists of eminence and to encourage them to engage themselves in this pursuit. I want to refer to the contribution made by three fiercely independent original thinkers who led the way for what today the Supreme Court is. And this was in the period from 1947 to 1980. Lawyers in pre-independent India through the sheer intellectual brilliance and erudite jurisprudential grounding and visionary outlook chartered the ship of judiciary through the turbulence of assertive legislature and executive grandstanding. For them, the humanism of the individual against the mighty state deserved benevolent treatment as the state bound by rule of law had to be just, fair, and reasonable. Individual liberties, according to them, could not be crushed by any law, because it is just law. The law has to be just. Powers of all authorities, including those of legislature, could be sustained only if the constitution, the source permitted and had to be transparent, accountable, and subject to the brooding omnipresence of the rule of law. The three persons about whom I'll speak briefly, Two of them I have been personally associated in a limited way, Mr. M. K. Nambiar and Justice Krishnayar. And the third is Justice, Chief Justice Kubara. Why did I choose them? Not because I happen to be associated with one or two of them. But I think they have made significant contribution in the field of advancement of constitutional jurisprudence at a time when not much was known about constitutional law in the country. At least two of them come from that time. And as we speak of Justice Krishnaya, he was a contemporary of Justice Kana, in whose memory we are today having this symposium or seminar. And both have made tremendous contribution. Justice Kanna, as Justice Rutta mentioned, 
made a huge sacrifice. He knew that he will not become the chief justice and he was giving up when he wrote that judgment in ADM Jabalpur. And it was he who, whose judgment has significantly strengthened and nurtured the basic structure theory because but for his judgment, there wouldn't have been a majority in the 13th judge case on the Barbie case. And before I go on to speak about them, I must thank Can Foundation for having organized this program to give a kind of idea to the students of the contributions which has been made by a number of jurists. I asked the question, why did I choose them? Mr. Nambia was the first person who, with his grounding in the constitutional and administrative law, had made an extensive study of the constitutions of the world, in particular of the United States, so that he could, with considerable amount of confidence, though his practice was essentially civil and criminal law, ventured into arguing the first important constitutional case in the Supreme Court of India. He was a government leader and a public prosecutor in a district court. He didn't start in the high court. And in spite of all that, he was chosen and he had the good opportunity and, and utilized it to the best of his ability, thanks to the scholarly work that he had done earlier on the field of constitutional and administrative law. And therefore, he could persuade the court to listen to him, though the court did not agree with him on most of what he said, except Justice Fazlali to some extent. I want to digress. Justice Dutta spoke about Justice B.K. Mukherjee. When I read A.K. Gopal again, I was a little curious how Justice Mukherjee, with his judicial outlook, could have accepted an argument advanced by the then Attorney General, which Justice Patanjali Shastri accepted. If I accept that, that means fundamental rights will come to an end virtually, because any law could authorize detention, taking away the liberty, and that need not stand the test of any other law. The argument of silos of each individual fundamental right being treated as a silo by itself and not coalescing, being tested together. Looking at the subsequent judgments of Justice Mukherjee to which reference had been made by Justice Dutta, the only explanation that I can give is the judges then were overwhelmed by the threat 
to the nascent democracy by what was then not known as an Naxalite movement, but a communist movement. And therefore, perhaps, did not want to interfere with the detention, with the preventive detention laws. I can't find any other explanation as to how uh, a judge like Justice Mukherjee could have upheld the law. It would have done a great honor to all the judges. In fact, uh, five out of those six judges became chief justices subsequently. If what came to be accepted subsequently in the 1970s had been accepted in the 1950s, the second reason that I can think of is the towering figure of Jawaharlal Nehru and of the persons who had fought for the freedom of the country, the enormous faith that the judges had in the leaders and the parliament, that they would not go to the extent of taking away the rights in an unjust manner. I think that faith that they had was perhaps one of the reasons. And that is why Justice Subrao in uh, Golakna, when he talks of uh, why he came to this conclusion, he says, Having regard to the past history of our country, it could not implicitly believe the representatives of the people for uncontrolled and unrestricted power might lead to an authoritarian state. Because by 1967, the court, the judges had seen how supremacy was being claimed by the legislature and the executive. And they were questioning the power of the court to test the law and executive action. I, the more I read Gopalan, the amount of, the kind of foresight that Mr. Nambiar had in advancing his argument in regard to how the right under Article 19, Article 21, Article 22, each one of them will have to be given effect to. Ultimately, the court accepted that argument. But I wish it had been accepted even at the earliest stage. Look at the importance which was given by Ms. Nambiar in the argument and the judges also in taking into account the preamble of the Constitution. Not empty words, the whole idea underlying our constitution is pithily put forth in that short preamble and that permeates the entire constitution. The amount of research that had gone in in advancing the arguments by looking into the history of the making of the constitution the Constituent Assembly debates, the various judgments of different, in different jurisdictions, the constitutional provisions of the United States, Japan, and the unwritten constitution, the rule of law underlying 
the Magna Carta. Now, these were the things that were spoken about in that judgment, in the arguments and considered in the judgment. I think it was very, very seminal contribution which was made by Mr. Nambiar. Any number of judgments. In fact, the, one of the earliest judgments where natural justice was considered necessary in exercise of even quasi-judicial power and administrative power was as far back as in 1958, Mr. Nambiar advanced his argument. Justice Subarao, as he then was, accepted the argument though he was in dissent, the majority did not exceed. It came to be subsequently accepted in Park in 1970. But his foresight was such that he advanced his argument even at that stage. Of course, all of us are familiar with various other constitutional doctrines, doctrine of eclipse, and his further argument that once a law is declared to be unconstitutional for violation of fundamental rights. You can't, by retrospective validation, revive it. That was not accepted. But in Coilo, it came to be accepted subsequently. So this was the kind of uh, uh, law, jurisprudential approach that Mr. Nambiar had. And that's the reason. Of course, I want to correct what Mr. Sornendu had said. I joined the office of Mr. Vanagopal. Mr. Nambiar had ceased to be, at that time, he was not uh, having his own juniors in that sense. But I did assist Mr. Nambiar in some of the cases. Therefore, I was fortunate to be associated with him in some of the cases, including in regard to liberty, because in 1974, the MISA came to be amended and the detainees, uh, the some of the smugglers were detained, and Mr. Nambiar was one of the most sought out counsel. He had appeared in Madras and Bombay, and he was to appear in alien Jabalpur in Supreme Court. He had come, but ultimately his health did not permit him to argue the matter. He passed away when the arguments were going on, and Mr. Bangopal and I were here uh, assisting as it were, we had to go back because he was unwell and he passed away in December 1975. Ms. Nambiar, his preparation was extraordinary. As a young counsel, I want to give an instance of uh, how he guided me very enthusiastically i will place a number of judgments for him he will go through and he will point out to one sentence which was not favorable say that yes three or paragraph after paragraph are in your favor but look at this i would not like to cite this judgment now that's a very important point because we had to not pick out one or two sentences in the judgment which may be useful for us, but we have to understand the entirety. And then trace out the judgment which is of, uh, which will be able to persuade a court to take a view in our favor when we argue. The second person about whom I want to speak is this Chief Justice Subarao. He again was fortunate to become a Chief Justice of a High Court on account of state sea organization at a very young age. And then came to the Supreme Court in 1958 and continued till 66. One common thread which runs through all the three persons is that for all of them, the single most important thing was that 
we are a country governed by rule of law. And for each one of them, it was clear that there was no question of supremacy of the legislature, judiciary, or the executive, because ultimately it is the constitution which is supreme. Nobody can claim that I am supreme. Legislature cannot claim that I am supreme over the judiciary, nor can judiciary claim the other way. It is the constitution which is supreme. All are answerable to the constitution. All are answerable to the people. We, the people, have given unto ourselves this constitution. This was what, again, Justice Subarao said in Keshe, in Golakna. And history will show that Chief Justice Gajendra Gatka, when he constituted the bench in Sajjan Singh, which came to consider the correctness or otherwise of Shankar Prasad, did not include this is Subara. Now, of course, we have had a lot of debates over the master of roads. The Chief Justice as the captain has the primacy and can decide who will constitute, who will be the members of the bridge. If Justice Subara the Shisha had been members of the Sajjan Singh case, perhaps even by in Sajjan Singh, the law would have been different. But it was left to Chief Justice Subarao when he became the Chief Justice to constitute a larger bench. And he constituted almost the entire court for considering Golatna. And he laid down that even constitutional amendment is law within the meaning of Article 13, but did not accept the limited argument of implied limitation advance in that case itself by Mr. Nambia. That, of course, was the foundation which was taken up by Mr. Palkibala later in Keshwan the Bharti and got accepted. But Subara also laid the basis for the law of privacy, the right of a prisoner. These are matters which were subsequently developed. Therefore, the concept of liberty. In fact, when I think today, some of the issues that arise in today's context of in the context of liberty and criminal law, all the three persons whom I have chosen would be quite perplexed by the kind of arguments that are being advanced in the courts today. Like, for example, to say that somebody should be kept in custody as an under trial, he's not cooperating. No, the three of persons whom I have mentioned would have been quite amazed by this kind of argument. When we have a constitutional provision that nobody can be compelled to self-incriminate. What is this concept of cooperation not being extended by an under trial? I, I mean, I fail to understand. And that is the reason for putting them in uh, jail. And I mean, this, uh, this, this is the kind of argument. Uh, anyway, I don't want to dilate on a subject uh, where, I mean, it, which could be quite controversial, but I, the kind of thinking that permeated 
among these three luminaries was liberty should be given prominence, preeminence by the court. And it is, they would have been shocked, particularly Justice Krishnaya's thesis of bail and not jail is the rule. Today is completely given a go by. And I'm, I think uh, uh, when Justice Cole said that some of the judges should be sent for training, I think a large number of judges in uh, the district judiciary and even in the high courts need to be educated afresh on the question of bail. I come to the third person, Justice Krishnaya. Justice Dratta spoke about two of the eminent judges, Justice Chandrachur and Justice Bhagavatu. He also spoke about Justice Kanna. And Justice Krishnaya was a contemporary and was one of the judges. In fact, he was junior to both Chief Justice Chandrachur and Chief Justice Bhagavati. But as it was felicitously put by one of the eminent jurists, Krishnayar, Krishnayar is the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court became far more humane and compassionate after Justice Krishnayar. It's the single most important contribution that he has made to the Indian judiciary. And I think Justice Chandrachur and Justice Bhagavati were profoundly influenced by Justice Krishnaya's thinking in their outlook, not merely to jail jurisprudence, but in regard to giving preeminence to individual liberty. The fact that he was a junior judge did not matter. And I think they respected him. And I, I, I would certainly say that we have, I have seen him in action. Of course, I had the good fortune of knowing him personally because his son Paramesh and I were classmates. And therefore, I had the occasion to visit Justice Krishnaya's house family. And I knew Mr. Sharda Krishnaya, who was herself a leader in her own right. Uh, a very good table tennis player, great sports enthusiast, great sports organizer. And I don't know how many of you know that she organized the Santosh Trophy in Kerala. She was uh, an important, uh, the head of the organizing committee, organizing the Santosh Trophy, uh, the soccer uh, trophy. She was uh, uh, so good. And uh, Justice Krishnaya gave enormous respect and regard to his wife. And uh, he was that way an equal rights person. Today we speak about uh, one about diversity and second about equal rights. Now I think Justice Krishnayar was a forerunner in all this. Mutama's case as uh, the Indian Foreign Service officer, how he gave uh, affirmation to the equal right is well known. I think Justice Krishnayar was the, I mean, uh, Ram Jatmani may have had differences over the language that Justice Krishna had used, and it was not some kind of artificial language, it was natural flow of language that he had. And even in conversation, one could see the way he could uh, uh, speak. He was, and the way he had been in jail as a political activist. He was a minister. He started the prison reforms as a minister. 
he when he became a judge the same thinking was infused in his jurisprudential approach and that's why you have nandini satpati's case and today yeah this is uh, yeah, thereafter the supreme court this is rohitan arman has followed it up with uh, having videography in every place when we talk of the other thing that is spoken about very often in courts today of custodial interrogation is needed the three persons who i am speaking about would have been quite short because the custodial interrogation that we are talking now about is really third degree method and if this is the purpose for which remand is needed it's a shocking state of affairs that is why in nandini satpati krishna has said as to what is the kind of protection that is needed even when a person is taken on remand he talked of rights of prisoners he talked of how bail is the rule and not jail he talked of how we can't have so many under trials in in consideration he talked of how it is only the poor and the depressed people who are being taken to jail and not the privileged the entitled ones these are things some of which have lost importance in these days and that's a sorry state of affairs i think we need to again revive this deep thinking i have difference with justice kishnayar in regard to right to business and right to property because we can't straight away take what he said in magalal chagalal for example where he said that while enacting a law there will be some persons who will be martyrs we can't have that we just as we can't have that kind of persons whose rights are trampled upon in regard to individual liberties personal liberty freedom in uh, equally even in the context of business and property we can't say that there will be martyrs you have to test the law as being just fair and reasonable in in respect of each and every individual there are so many judgments of justice krishnayar that one can speak about but we have now reached 515 and i don't think it would be appropriate for me to continue any longer but i think we need to revive the spirit with which these individuals these juries advance the thinking that it is rule of law which has to prevail in a democracy otherwise we will have autocracy we will have a dictatorship that is very important to be born in mind and we need to constantly remind ourselves that it is the constitution which is supreme it is the rule of law which is supreme thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir uh, for your enlightening speech we learned a lot from this from your speech sir, about the three eminent personalities whom you had talked about Uh, late Mr. Nambiar, Justice Krishna Iyer, and Just Justice Subbarao, and really, sir, we we quite agree that uh, the rule of law and the constitutionalism are the bedrocks of our Indian Constitution. And I personally agree with you, since I I belong to the chambers of late Mr. Rao, P. P. Rao. So I have seen, I have I have heard from him the stories. and the stories of 1970s and 19, 1980s and these three and these two judges and also of late mr nambiar and is addressing the court in i see golaknath so i quite agree and quite visualize the things what sir used to say and of course the constitution on account of constitutionalism just fair and reasonableness and the, also the principle of what what was propounded by justice i uh, justice i the bail is the rule and jail is an exception but Today, circumstances has somehow 
as we have lost sight, we have we are continuously losing sight of the fact with more number of custodial interrogation and remands, and also Justice Calls remark few days back. Of whom, sir, it, it, sir, it was quite enlightening to uh, enriching to hear you on these three on on legal luminaries, these three legal luminaries, and of course, Justice Krishna Iyer's conditional stay of order of uh, the Allahabad High Court judgment. Uh, also gives us a sight of how oh, how powerful a judge he was sitting in the vacation as a single judge as there on under the 1966 rules he had stayed uh, he had stayed conditionally the judgment of Justice Jagmohan Lal Sinha Allahabad High Court unseating the Prime Minister of the country so therefore sir we we quite understand and. Also, it's quite enriching to hear you on the rule of law and the aspect. We wish we could hear you more on this aspect. And uh, it was truly enriching in this symposium to hear you on this on this aspect. Now, uh, I would start with the vote of thanks. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, good evening to uh, my Lord Justice uh, Dipankar Datta. And um, Justice Geeta Mittal, just also Justice M. Sundarish, who attended the first session. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to serve as a moderator at the third Justice H.R. Khanna Memorial National Symposium. And also, I also thank my fellow colleagues and the senior advocates who are there on the dais. My gratitude goes to the National Law University. Bhopal and Hidayatullah National Law University, Raipur, as well as the Can Foundation for hosting this esteemed event. The symposium was divided into two separate sessions, covering different topics for discussion. The esteemed panelists provided their fruitful insights on the overarching themes of state surveillance and privacy, the Lakshman Rekha between, and the legal stalwarts and their contribution to the modern Indian judicial system. Their impeccable knowledge on these topics of discussion was really a food for thought, for everyone attending the session. Especially, I would like to thank Justice Datta for, for guiding young, young legal professionals like us with, with, his, with his anecdotes in the first session where he said, where, where he had quoted about three C's, what, what we should have in the profession when we start, and also a honeymoon, also uh, a hunger for your, uh, for your profession, also honey on your tongue while you start off. And also, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the judges on the dais, and I'm equally delighted to have been in the esteemed presence of the judges of the Honorable Supreme Court, Justice Dipankar Datta and Justice Sundaresh, and the former Chief Justice of Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh High Court, Justice Geeta Mittal, Vedinathan Sir, Guru Krishna Kumar Sir, and Mr. Sham Devan Sir, senior advocates of the Supreme Court of India, who contributed immensely as esteemed panelists. In addition, I was privileged to witness Professor Dr. Surya Prakash, Vice Chancellor of NLIU Bhopal and Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, Registrar of HLU Raipur, delivered the welcome address. Your insightful words really set the tone right for the symposium. I'm honored to be a part of the group of young emerging members of the bar, many of whom are members of the member of foundation for moderating the sessions at the symposium. Their collective efforts have truly made the event fruitful. My gratitude extends to the esteemed partners of the organization, including Bar and Bench, SEC Online, Tethanen Co, Lakshmi Kumar and Sridharan, Dentons, Link Legal, Phoenix Legal, Cycration Associates, Economic Law Practices, whose support has made this symposium possible. Lastly, I thank all the participants for their active engage, in, engagement and insightful contributions, making the symposium a platform for intellectual growth and exchange. Thank you all for your presence and support. We are truly enriched. Thank you all. Thank you, sir.